I didn't want to hate. I felt, at that time, I felt let down. I felt let down by the system. I felt literally thrown away by my colleagues because no one contacted me. No one once asked me, how are you, Cynthia? How are you hanging on? Are you okay? None of that. I felt that the world has just, you know, ignored me. I felt ostracized. The whole SA system let me down. The whole legal system let me down. And I realized I cannot have these thoughts in my head because it's not good for me mentally. And I needed to find a way to forgive. Welcome. If you have watched the previous episode of this Tough Minds, Tender Hearts and Steady Hands conversation, which was a group discussion with Mandy Wiener reflecting on her book The Whistleblowers, you'll recall that I ended that discussion by talking with a bit of rapt admiration about another whistleblower whose story is not told in the book, although she is mentioned, Cynthia Stimple. Now, she has this platform to herself today because she's got such an extraordinary story to tell of her journey of faith as a senior executive of South African Airways that was essentially fired for just trying to do a job that I wanted to just give her maximum opportunity to reflect in our particular space here which is actually the context of it is a weekly Christian men's breakfast group that we have where we try and help each other as brothers to try and be faithful to the scriptures and our professional work. So that's the emphasis, but we don't want that in any way to be exclusive. So I've invited a number of other folk from different networks of mine to sit in and hear the conversation so that we can distill something from this. Cynthia was employed as the group treasurer for South African Airways, having journeyed in a long and distinguished career in the banking and finance sector, and then she was suspended by top management SAA in 2016 after she questioned the lack of due process that her colleagues under the chairmanship of the chair Dudu Mayeni wanted to go for a 15 billion rand cash raising deal and it was going to be done by a transaction advisor BNP Capital mm-hmm. who would have got a 256 million facilitation fee. She felt the South African banks could do this cheaper and this was not prudent financial risk. So she blew the whistle. She saved South African Airways from falling into the hands of still unknown forces, but was not able to save it from a crash landing. And I just can't help feeling that that might have been averted had the board and top management embraced her for her integrity instead of intimidating her to try and shut her up. But they failed. So having got to know Cynthia, I'm in absolute awe of her resilience, her courage, and her faith. It's her faith that is really of interest to us today. After Cynthia shared her story, we will open up for comments from my friends and my breakfast group and elsewhere. Because this is really something which I would want us to take shared responsibility for. It shouldn't be left up to individuals working in such isolation. To, to blow the whistle. We need to have a support system for them. Before we hear about how you weathered the storm, let's go back 50 years or so, when you were a young girl growing up. Tell us about your family upbringing and what that did to make you who you are today. Thank you, John, and thank you for having me here. And thank you to everyone that's listening in. I actually didn't know my grandparents, so um, the one recollection of my father's father is that there's a picture in our lounge, which still is still there in my parents' home, and that's all I know. On my mother's side, I did get to know my granny and got to know her well because we shared the same birthday. So she came and visited us on rare occasions, and when I then could drive, I visited her. By then, she had a stroke and was bedridden. So just to go back, how did I grow up? I come from a family of nine siblings. So we were quite a large family, a Catholic family at that. My dad was Catholic, my mom was Methodist, and they decided they will bring us up Catholic. And 
My parents' daughter's values, strong values. I recall uh, just short stories, if you don't mind. Yeah. When my elder sister and I went, it was during the holidays, we went to play at our neighbor's home, and we had. And our neighbor had lovely dolls, which we were cuddling the whole day, and we wanted to come home with the dolls. And the mother of um, our friend said, oh, we could take them home and bring them the next day. When we came home with these dolls, my mom said, no, you take those dolls right back. And she walked us back home, apologized for us taking those <laughs> dolls, and we had to return them. So it was, um, they, they had this mantra that they would always recite, do not take what's not yours. You know, um, when in doubt, don't. Uh, so they always had these little sayings for us and it came out through all our lives that we couldn't take anything that did not belong to us. We could not um, lie. We could not, uh, you know, so the, the values were set at an early age. So from my grandparents' perspective, as I said, I only got to know my grandmom, but I, um, because I got to know a cl more for me as an adult, she left some little issues in our home where she would say, don't sweep out late at night because she's sweeping the good luck out, you know, so she had those type of sayings. But I, from a value perspective, I think um, I didn't really get to, we got it more from our parents, mm. the principles and the values that we lived. And your brother is a priest, I believe, out at Regina Mundi. So you grew up with a very strong kind of sense of a stable, secure, happy family. Yes, um, definitely. Um, I would say all families have their ups and downs, but we were secure in the sense that my father was quite rigid in when we came home from school. He was working. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. She took care of all of us. And it was homework when my dad came home. He checked the homework. He, we had to do our times table. We had to do our catechism every evening. So it was all that sort of thing that happened every evening. Um, once we've had dinner and um, we've all bought and ready for bed. During winter, we grew up that um, we were taught in the garden as children. My dad taught us how to fix things. We could all do gardening. We could all um, sandpaper wood and varnish it. The boys had to learn how to knit and to cook. So winter time, we were sitting around reading. We all had to learn to read and then read aloud so my parents could hear us. And we were helping the younger ones continuously also learn with us. And we, a family now that just loves reading, if you, any family member, if you speak to them, we all have the love for reading. Um, the, the, my brother was the priest. He cooks his own meals even today. He's, it's a skill he learned and he, he can decide what he wants to do and what he wants to eat on the day, which is really great. And I just think it's, it's those skills we still have up to today. Mm. Now, um, one of the influences in our breakfast group is a Franciscan priest, Father Richard Rawl, the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation. And a major influence on me and many people in my fellowship and networks. Um, he talks about the spiritual journey as one of moving from order to reorder. Now, the order, as you've described it, is nice, stable, comfortable, predictable, but not enough to sustain a really living faith in a rapidly changing world, particularly and especially for young people. It becomes a bit ossified, like old wineskins. But if I may, may use an air travel metaphor, seeing you worked for South African <laughs> Airways, there's no non-stop flight from order to reorder to the new wines, new wineskins. One has to go and transit via disorder, which can be a frightening, bumpy ride. So tell us what happened in your career in South African Airways, when they decided to reroute you to another terminal. <laughs> Sorry, I just love metaphors. <laughs> My daughter teases me. She says, Dad, just don't overwork them. Anyway, but it got you fired and left you stranded, potentially without a passport, not knowing how to get out. So tell us a bit about that darkest moment for you. Thank you. That reminds me of the movie Terminal where the guy couldn't get out uh, and his passport had expired yeah. and he was just stuck in the terminal for a couple of months. Mm. Yes, so um, firstly, it hits you like a slap in the face. Um, your whole career, um, when you go by the work ethic of always doing 
things correctly and making sure you follow the rules, the regulations, the processes, the governance, and you live, you actually live that work ethic. And then suddenly you, you are thrown off course because you no longer, um, you're the one that is being the victim, you're the one that's being perceived, you did the wrong thing, knowing full well you didn't. So yes, uh, during that time, those dark, um, when I, I can call it the dark days, I relied on prayer. I relied on my, my inner faith and just saying, Lord, I trusted you when I knew I was going to do this. It wasn't a decision you make overnight and saying, you know what, I'm going to whistle blow. It's, you see the first thing and you're saying this is not right and you start questioning it. Then you see the next thing and you start questioning it. And, and so the process goes and you, who do I talk to? You do take it to your seniors. I've taken it firstly to my very boss saying this is not right. We should not be doing this. But she said she doesn't need instruction from me. She takes instruction from board. And besides, I don't make the decision. So you left and you take, uh, I took um, the, the board resolution to our head of internal audit saying to them, what do you do? Uh, this is irregular. What do I do here? He confirmed it's irregular, but didn't give me guidance what to do then. I took it to two executives who said, yes, this is the route you can follow. But you still left on your own. And then you only rely on your inner, um, I would say, inner strength, inner feelings, inner values, and your faith. I actually went to a priest to talk to him and saying, that I'm in this dilemma. I am not sure what would happen once I do this. And his advice at the time was just saying, be careful, but make sure you do, you follow the process, which I said, well, I am, I have been doing it. Uh, so... Over that period, I really did pray a lot. It wasn't just that I went and did it and said, leave it at that. It, you had this feeling of, am I doing the right thing? But although you know it, so the self-doubt is going through your mind. The, the, the checks and balances keeps going through your brain. Okay, I've done this, that, that, that. Now what? Mm. You know, And you have this constant challenge within yourself that... I tried to do the right thing. I tried to elicit um, help from everyone else, speak to other seniors, speak to my mm. peer group, and you still feel the challenge that um, I'm now left out in the dark. I'm left on by the wayside. What carried me, I must say, was my faith. I, um, I literally, then I had to let go. I had to trust in God and say, you know what? You have to carry me. And I can tell you now, I, he carried me. Mm the story of the footsteps you know mm. when you say why when you uh, the question was to Jesus why there were two footprints and there's only one and where were you but it's definitely that time mm. when I know Jesus carried me through it so well let me talk about that footsteps thing because we make the road by walking is a Correct. another famous saying and for me the wild coast has been the place where I go walk you're telling me about how you, in the midst of this crisis, you took time out and you went to the Camino and you were walking that Camino pilgrimage in Spain and you were seized to actually get to an internet cafe and to send an SMS. Tell us, tell us a bit about what happened then, what, what precipitated that, that need to go for that journey and, and, and what resulted. Okay, then in my story, there's actually the two Caminos. The first Camino was a gift I got from my husband, um, which I walked from Paris to Chartres, which is in France. Main reason, because I have an interest in um, the labyrinth. So mm. I don't know if you've ever walked yes. a labyrinth. It's, it's also a meditative walk mm. that one does, which then gets your mind focused. And, so it's, and it's a prayerful walk. So... While I was doing that um, pilgrimage walk, it was literally midway. It was Wednesday when I received this WhatsApp from my colleague saying that he signed the deal. Although I gave him instructions prior to my leaving, don't sign anything because that would then set the ball rolling for this transaction to be approved by board. And I said, don't do anything until I get back. And he promised me he would not do it. 
and yet he did. So when I received that, I thought, what do I do now? Because I know the next step, it's going to go for approval at the Bid Adjudication Committee, which is where they approve all the tenders. And from there, it would go to board. And, and that's when I decided at this cafe, we had got there and I got to the, uh, spoke to the head of our leader of our group. And I just said to him, please, I just need to do this, this is something very serious and I need to do it now. And they were already walking on to explore into a church and he, he said, stay and you can meet us there. So I stayed and I wrote this message because I could have access to the Wi-Fi and then I sent it out to him. So yes, so that was my first step of sort of um, mm. saying that I don't know how else to do it, but I need to tell you that this is going to happen at SAA. At the time, I thought uh, National Treasury would have stopped it. You know, I wouldn't have needed to go on further. It would have been something they could have stepped in and dealt with. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Mm. So the next is when I was actually suspended and subsequently took the um, settled with SAA was, what do I do now? Because I didn't want to hate. I felt. At that time, I felt let down. I felt let down by the system. I felt um, literally thrown away by my colleagues because no one contacted me. No one once asked me, how are you, Cynthia? How are you hanging on? Are you okay? None of that. I felt um, that the world has just, you know, ignored me. I felt ostracized. And um, at the same time, I had this feeling that even my lawyer let me down. Um, the, the whole SA system let me down, the whole legal system let me down. And I realized I cannot have these thoughts in my head because it's not good for me uh, mentally. And I needed to find a way to forgive. And that's when I decided I need to walk this Camino. And then I called my family together and I said, I need to do this for me. I need to walk it alone. I need to find a way that I can let go of all these negative thoughts in my mind and that I need to pray more to see what's mm. the new path ahead for me. Because I said, this didn't happen to me um, without knowing there's a new path for me. Because I believe that adage where it says, God never closes one door if he's not going to open another for you. And it was that I needed to find out what is my next path? Mm. What is the next door that will open for me? And that's how I continued on that Thank you. Well, I'm just listening to you thinking of all sorts of scriptures that come to life and come to mind in me. I mean, obviously, the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. Yes. Um, the other one which comes to mind is, you know, the, you know, the, the journey through the storm on the, yes. de on, on the water of Galilee. And where somebody said there was a storm to pass through. There was a place to pass to. And there was a message to pass on. What was happening there? Because I've heard responses from other people that talk of very similar toxic environments. And I think this is a broader issue than just simply blowing a whistle. It's how do we ensure organizations have a culture of freedom? Yeah. Exactly that. Um, at that time, we were working in a toxic environment because you could almost see that the atmosphere was, um, there was, it was fear-based. And it starts with the top. So when your CEO gets suspended, when he's walking into his office and finds the doors locked, that he can't access his office, and his doors has been purposely locked, and as in physical locks mm -hmm. changed, by the then chairperson, Dudu Mayeni, and he's then escorted out of the building by two bodyguards. And obviously, they on the sixth floor, we on the fourth floor, word gets around in no time and everyone's whispering and talking about what had happened. So you really start thinking, what's going on? You know, because you don't get the full story at the time until it's out in the media. But you, the fear factor starts hitting in what now? Um, then it's the next, then you hear someone else is being suspended. Our, our chief operations officer is suspended. Then your chief procurement officer is suspended. You know, and I'm asking the questions of everyone. What's going on? 
are these people so bad? I've sat in meetings with them. I, I could hear the um, recommendations or the presentations that they're giving. They can't be so bad what's put out in, in the internal media. And so um, you, you question and um, you start talking to other people, other department heads, etc. And I recall one conversation with um, a lady from our HR and I said to her, um, what would Jesus do right now, you know? And, um, she, and she, she was saying, well, we, what do we do? And I said, you know, if Jesus was here in the 21st century, he would speak out because he did that. He, in, if you follow his, his route, when they wanted to stone the woman, he was the one that stood up against them. He could have walked past, he could have ignored it, he didn't. You know, when he saw that they were mishandling or uh, mismanaging the temple for, for making financial gain through selling things, he stopped it. You know, there was various occasions where he stood up and stood out. When people ostracized the lepers, he was the one that said no and um, would rather embrace a leper. So for me, um, I think that was the thought at the time. And I felt that if this happens in my sphere, because I have no control over someone else's department, mm -hmm. I can support them, but I can't um, go in gung-ho and, and force them to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so you could almost see what's happening in each of the departments. And our department was left totally un um, out of it for the, uh, for the past years until we needed to go for, for funding. And that's when, when the interference came there was when I felt, I am not going to allow this to happen on my watch. And in 2016, 2017, 18, you're going through this ordeal and then suddenly you call to go and testify and there's under commission. And those you Do you consider the oath to be binding on your conscience? Yes, I do. Do you solemnly swear that all the evidence that you will give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you. So, but uh, how is it possible that a whole board could uh, make a resolution that talks about a 14 mil billion rand offer on the basis of a letter, one that doesn't um, refer to such an amount, two that clearly says this is not a commitment? Is that something you are able to explain or you are also not able to understand? So I can only or maybe you have insight as to how they could have <laughs> yes, Chair, talked I like can that. Perhaps look at the constitution of the board at the time, and mm -hmm. that would give you an indication of how decisions were made. Mm -hmm. So um, the constitution consisted of chairperson being Ms. Dudu Mieni, um, Ms. Kinana, um, Yake Kinana, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Um, Tambi and then uh, Ms. Nahansi and uh, Mr. Twane. Mm. Chair, and, yes. apologies. Yes, and, and I see they already say the interim CFO and the acting C CEO must go ahead and do everything and sign and execute Correct. without seeing any further information that they would have needed to see to have a commitment of of this nature with any entity. Exactly, Chair, and that is what concerned me because mm. I, there was no letter forthcoming. I asked for a term sheet. There was no term sheet forthcoming. Um, there was, I was even asked to ratify this board resolution, mm. and I said, no, I'm not doing anything until I get the full, well, not the board resolution, to ratify the decision of FTC. Mm. And once I received the board, um, resolution and saw that it was the decision was made via a letter which I wasn't able to see I was very uncomfortable and I stated that and hence um, with the FRAC we said we will follow due process rather we will rather send out another RFP because our recommendation was scrap everything and start again mm. or send out an RFP to FTC then do your comparisons and they said to save time let's just send the RFP out, which we did. And only based on that, once we received the RFP back from FTC, were we able to then assess 
where they could fit in with um, the comparisons of the other respondees. Thank you. Mm. And that's when I spoke out. But you know, Cynthia, that, that passage you mentioned about Jesus and the woman caught in adultery, interestingly, an insight which came to me many years ago from our fellowship neighborhood gospel group is that in terms of the criteria for stoning, <laughs> Jesus actually met it. He could have cast the first stone because yes. he was without sin, as we believe in our Catholic doctrine and teaching. How do I find a merciful, forgiving approach mm -hmm. to this whole thing? How do I not allow this to turn me into a state of bitterness and resentment? Mm -hmm. How do I allow myself not to them to give them a victory over destroying my own sense of integrity? Because you come across as being totally at peace, and I could see our Judge Zondo so pleased to have somebody who just didn't, who just exuded a sense of integrity. But tell us from your subjective experience how you felt in the, in the Zondo Commission and the sense of particularly not only your testimony, but then hearing Dudumayeni and others coming up and hearing what they were had to say. <laughs> yes, um, so, you know, once the... Um I would call it the saga um, up to 2017. Then I went to do my Camino and I came back and I reinvented myself. So I thought this is the path I want to follow. And, um, and it was to the end of 2018 when I got this call from um, Advocate Kunene asking me to uh, identifying himself as a Zondo Commission investigator and that if I could please come and meet with him. It was a five, almost six hour long interview. But I remember coming home so exhausted, just having to talk to them. And that was then the first uh, step in preparation for my affidavit. So I had to prepare my affidavit and work with the investigators because they are so thorough. They want every single, for every sentence, they want proof, mm. you know, of, um, and then the day comes when I'm actually now sitting at the Zonda Commission. That day, I was totally calm, and I really was. I had no fear. People asked me, weren't you afraid? Weren't you scared? Weren't you nervous? I actually wasn't. Mm. I, um, everything I knew, because it was the path I followed, I knew the dates because it was in my head. And as I was questioned by the evidence leader and by the chairperson, um, Zondo, um, he, I could answer. And for me, it was just now telling my truth explaining to him what happened with every question that they put forward, I could answer it. So at the end of those, it was basically one full day and half of the next day. And then I just stayed on to listen to two other witnesses, um, which were from the Grissac company. And, but I know it was then that I felt vindicated. It was, I could speak out to a wider, um, listening uh, group, which was the country. It wasn't just five people in a room. It was the entire South Africa who could listen and decide for themselves now, did I take the right, the right stance and how it was. And for me, it was just, here's my opportunity that I could speak out mm. and just share my story. Mm. Now, talk a bit more about your experience with lawyers. Now, um, we've got a couple of lawyers in my breakfast group. And I tease them because I say, you know, the problem with lawyers is it's just 95% of them give all the rest a bad name. <laughs> now, it's unkind to actually put it that way, but like the, they laugh because the point I really is, is that it, in the same in every profession, the law isn't in itself going to bring about social justice. Mm -hmm. It's going to be lawyers that do that. Yeah. It's not just social work that's going yeah. to be doing whatever social work should be doing. It's social workers, it's teachers, it's people that embody the actual principles and the rest. Now, share with it about your experience, because I know a lot of us think, well, I need justice, I'm going to go to the courts, I'm going to get a labor lawyer, everything will be resolved. And my experience as a social worker is that very, very seldom do people, even if they win, feel particularly pleased about the outcome of what happens in court. So the court process and speaking to your lawyer is, is lengthy in that they're also very detailed. 
And as you're speaking, you have to write your affidavit and you have to then make sure that every point is factual and you must back it up with evidence. So, and it's never just one meeting with your lawyer. It's a couple of meetings and you, you do three days in a row of meeting him. Then you call back another week later and you spend another two or three consecutive days working with him. So it's, it's ongoing um, giving evidence, talking, them questioning, them um, trying to find evidence related elsewhere to back up the truth. My experience though is that lawyers are good and they are thorough and they are doing their job. In my case, I guess, um, and that's why I felt I needed to forgive, was that I felt my lawyer could have done more. Um, he so just during the Labour Court? During the, 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 the whole CCMA. Labour Court and the CCMA. And looking back, I don't blame him for the advice he gave me because what happens is that every time we came, we would prepare and we get to the CCMA fully prepared. And... SAA's lawyers would be there, but the SAA representatives were not. So you couldn't continue because the lawyer can't represent without his um, representative being there. And it was delayed for the next month and the next month. And this was the continuing path, which my lawyer actually said, all they want to do is exhaust you. They want to um, let you spend as much money as possible um, until you give up. And that was their strategy, which was true. And so in the end, uh, my lawyer advised me, we can continue this for another year. Or we could just you cut your losses and, and just take cut it and take it, and and mm. and you can carry on with your life, and um, then at least you you won't be suffering this for another year or two, and um, that way you can end it, close the door, yeah. and start a new life. And I then had the discussion with my husband and my children and my siblings, and they all said, well. They, because they all feel the pain with you. They walk that journey. While you're in this, you're preparing and then another month of waiting and another month of waiting. And so um, on that basis, we agreed. And um, I went for a six-month settle. Well, I wanted up to my retirement age, which was 63 at the time. And SAA said, no, just six months. And my lawyer said, you know, I'll just take it, um, which we did. And on that basis, we settled, yes. See, my dog approves of that. <laughs> Something about that. I hope it doesn't. Do. Hey, but let me just pause on that one, and we're going to now move to closure and open up for conversation with others, because this is the point of commonality with us. You know, it's it's about using lawfare, and it's a way that people with power and with deep pockets will then use and abuse, and um, maliciously abuse legal process in order to basically tie you out in a litigation by attrition strategy. And that's the same thing it applies to those of us who are now facing slap suits. Mm. So that's really why I have obviously got to sort of thump that tub a little bit. And the insight which I've came to through that whole thing is that in, war, in warfare, they say truth is always the first casualty. Mm. Whereas in lawfare, truth becomes the hostage. By the dominant side that wants to keep the truth suppressed. And that then requires enormous fortitude, patience and stamina. Tell us a bit about how you kept going. So, um, yeah, so once that happened was then I went on the second Camino. And through that, the thoughts, I journaled every day, um, feelings um, that I was, you know, of, of, of hatred. I did have feelings of hatred for everything around me at the time and I just journaled it and then I had feelings of fear where do I go from here mm. um, I've studied and literally um, my studies were not easy because at the time of growing up um, in a family of seven I applied for the university to study at VIT I wanted to go into the medical field and I could didn't get the, the ministerial consent. And I had to apply to the colored university in, in Belleville. And my dad couldn't afford to send me there. So he, my dad then looked at the papers. He said, look, there's an opening at the banks. They're now taking people of color. Um, you can study through the banks. And that's what my studies was. I studied part-time all my life up to, I have an MBA today, but it was all part-time studying. You know, even risk management that I have, the, the whole 
corporate governance, everything I, to do with my field, I studied. When I was at SAA, there were no courses on the airline. And I asked my then boss, Ricky Thurian, who was the group treasurer then, and I said, how do I learn about the airline? How do I learn about the finance surrounding it? And he said, well, there's these two books. Um, it's called Flying Off Course, by the way. And, by, um, and I uh, bought the books. It cost me 1500 But I invested, you know, so my studies were never just simple. They, they, to, to gain the knowledge of my field, I studied through that. How and um, so through that was, now I have this MBA, how do I use it? I have risk management skills, how do I use it? Where do I use it? Do I just give it up and go find a hole and cry in it? Or do I find ways of reinventing myself? And, and that's as I walked, these were the thoughts that came. I looked at where were my strengths? My strengths, yes, I, um, I can do public speaking, why not? And I put that down. Where do I use my risk management skills? I said, probably at board levels. I do not, at that time, I did not want to go back into a corporate and be subjected to the same type of atmosphere. And I felt, but I could perhaps use those skills in boardrooms and guide others on having ethical boards. And so it meant studying further and I went to study further thereafter. What was my passions? I loved yoga. And then I came back and I studied yoga. Today, mm. I teach yoga to adults and to children. And um, I meditated a lot. So I do walking meditations. I do quiet meditations. In the Catholic faith, one of our meditative um, uh, methods is saying the rosary. So I do that often. Mm. Others use like in the, in the Hindu um, uh, religion they they have they also have beads and that they recite with in the Muslim culture they also have this set of beads they recite so it's something similar and that's a meditative form so I just practiced all those in my normal life and I just continued that during this journey with the Camino and thought and when I came back I must say that I literally felt light that I was not carrying any unnecessary burdens that I could see a clear path for me ahead and that's the path which I'm still forging today. Wow. Um, getting back to Richard Raw's idea of order, disorder, reorder. So you're in this reordering stage now mm -hmm. and he patterns that very much on the idea that you've been into your dark cave, you've crossed, to use the, the calming of the storm story, you've crossed over, you've taken a step out of the boat, you felt you've been sinking, you've been pulled back. What is the message that you need to now pass on? And what is your particular elixir or, or gift to the world now that, because, and I wanted you to share this because many people would say, I'm not prepared to do that. It looks too much of a sacrifice. However, in the sacrifice, there is a sense in which once you go the full Monty, you end up at a place saying, my gosh, I'm so much happier now because I'm, I haven't sort of betrayed my sense of integrity. So tell us about where you see your life going. Thanks, John. So, um, yeah, there's many paths um, that could lead to, to a, a firm direction. And for me right now is I'm trying to link all my skills that I have to walk this path. What I'd like to leave for everyone as a legacy is, and for my children and my grandchildren, is that we need to follow our true values, our principles that we grew up with. Because we all taught the right thing. I don't think any parent will teach their children the wrong thing. No parent does that. Mm. But when you come into a school environment and then you see bullying, and then you think it's okay if the bully gets away with it. And you come into a corporate environment and you see uh, corporate theft or corporate uh, contraventions and people think it's okay. And that's where I feel this, the test is of our um, true values and our true purpose. And, and it's that where you need to stand firm against or speak up against or walk away from. Not often that we do have the strength to challenge, you know, um, because maybe I would not have acted the same if I, my children were small. I don't know, you know, mm. that I could make that decision. But my children were already adults. For those who still have children at school and, and tell themselves, if I lose my job now, I lose everything. I lose my house. 
Where do my children school? So it's a different decision you're going to make. But that decision needs to be based on your values and your, your principles and your, your faith. I would still go with faith no matter which path we, we walk in that. And then it would be probably to leave and walk away, resign and, do, you know, and I would, so that's what I'd like to leave, that they always look at that because that's your grounding. That's what keeps you firm. Um, that's what your foundation is. Mm-hmm. How do you use what you have going forward and, and as a path? It's again, look, looking internally and saying, how can I be that shining light in the darkness to others? And um, my way right now is that I know it is hard out there and I know that the Protected Disclosures Act has not protected us. So what could I do to make it better for the next person who's going to follow me later? I would like to challenge the Protected Disclosures Act and make it start protecting properly in Mm -hmm. every sphere of that whistleblower. So it's not just losing your job because Mm -hmm. that's what it says. It says the occupational detriment, uh, detriment that the person may suffer. But what about financial income? What about um, the mental stress, the trauma, the, the psychiatric help that I may have needed? I didn't need it, fortunately, but others do that I'm speaking to needed that. We, who's helping them there? Who's guiding them? There's no protection for that. You're left on your own. Um, what about um, when I cannot get a job in the future, even though I have an MBA and I've got banking skills? No one out there is willing to offer me a job and no one out there is prepared to walk the path and saying, yeah, I know Cynthia, and she will show the integrity you need, but no one's prepared to do that. So it's, I'm looking at enhancing together with a few of us, how do we enhance that Protectors Disclosures Act so that whoever follows South Africa's whistleblowers in the future do not follow the same detriment that we did. The other legacy I'd like to leave is that we've seen our country and I know we're all passionate about our country. We all love South Africa. But we've seen the demise of South Africa in the past 10, 12 years. And why? Because, and I can speak for myself here, is I was in, focused on my job, making sure that I do the job my best ability. I was focused on my family and protecting them in their way. And yes, there was the news and we followed the news. We knew it was there. We saw what was happening. There are laws in place that will take care of it. But those laws failed us. All the governance processes around it failed us. So now it's up to each one of us. So I'm saying each one of us now have a duty as South Africans to become active citizens and for us to now make a difference where we are, no matter what our job is, no matter how small it is, we all need to, we need to say it's up to me to make the difference where I am because it's like throwing that pebble in the pond. You can actually see the ripple effect Mm. around it and I feel that's our role as South African citizens now. Mm. And, and the foundation you formed, Citizens of Conscience, yes. are you ready to talk about that yet? Yes, I am. Um, so I formed this through, first we started off as just a WhatsApp support group of whistleblowers. So as I got to know through the media, I looked them up and asked them, are they willing to talk with me, met with them, and we became the support group where we could just talk about our stories and share our stories and help where we could. We've then... Um, as at August registered our organization called Citizens of Conscience. We're looking at different pillars and the, the one pillar, as I mentioned, was definitely looking at the, the Protected Disclosures Act and changing it and finding the legal system to support us in that. Because we can't go do it. None of us, are, I won't say none of us, two of us are lawyers, but we need a bigger support system to make sure we can, mm-hmm. um, and working with people like Outer and mm-hmm. Corruption Watch and Freedom Under Law and all those civil societies. Um, the other is taking care of the whistleblower holistically. And then looking at the financial aspect, because we all suffered financial detriment. I'm in a better place, perhaps because of my age and the way I've managed my finance, but others are not in that space. And it's how to help whistleblowers and also set up a platform, because the challenge is that when you want to whistleblow, where do you go? 
you have your hotlines, the minute your name is out there, your company would mention your name, which they should not even be mentioning that this person has mentioned this issue and we need to deal with it. Rather, they find ways of challenging this person and the, and the way it's done, it's through the Labor Relations Act in your conduct at work or has this person taken leave days that they didn't put their leave form in? Mm. Has this person done anything and in, instead mm. of investigation is going around the person instead of the issue the person raised? Mm. And that needs to stop because that's mm. blackballing. And those are the issues we want to challenge, that companies need to also make it a safer place. You spoke about earlier about working in this toxic environment. and. It's now if companies are saying these are our values and they're placing them on the wall and in their financial statements and the, the CEOs are espousing them when they make their speeches, but they, the behavior is not there. It's how do you get mm. that safe space that as staff members we can speak out if we see something mm. not right in our organizations. How do we speak out? Where do we speak out? And know that no one is going to victimize me. It's mm. that type of safe spaces we need to work. You can't say you have an ethics or um, department and you have a whistleblowing hotline and you have your corporate governance king four, you're following all the principles, but the atmosphere and the whole space is not conducive for whistleblowers to speak out. And that is a shared responsibility we all have, and let's mm. now open up and invite folk to make comments uh, and thoughts and questions to uh, Cynthia. Huge admiration, Cynthia, and thank you so, so much for doing what you have done and what you continue to do, because I think that you are a huge inspiration. What is so striking to me, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm the sister of Rosemary Hunter, who's also on the call today, and she's done exactly what you did, but in the Financial Services Board, and she does have a chapter in, in Mandy Wiener's book. Um, so I've seen it one step removed from, from what Rosemary and had spoken about throughout the process. Um, I'm just wanting to maybe emphasize some of the things you're saying. One is that the importance of, of having family and friends and people to talk to throughout the process. I mean, I think that you, you've given a lovely account of how you, you spoke to them about it. You asked for their support in the decision as to whether to, to speak out, knowing that it was going to have a, a huge risk and impact on your family. And just in terms of, um, of every message that goes out there, I think that must not be forgotten, that people must value their relationships, they must build strong relationships and so on. Um, of course, a very tricky thing in our family, and um, I'd be interested in, in how you dealt with it, is the fact that given your seniority, there, there, are, lots of, um, there are lots of facts and figures in your story that you can't say. Um, whether it's for legal reasons, whether it's for loyalty to the other people maybe who are involved or loyalty to the bigger system or, you know, varieties. And how do you deal with that? Because when you come to trying to convince an ignorant public, and the public is ignorant, they don't know the stresses and strains you're under, they don't know the, the compliance issues, they don't know a whole range of things. So you have to almost, um, dare I use the word, dumb down the story. You have to simplify the flow diagram in order to be able to communicate it effectively to the next person. And within that, that's where the gray areas or the loopholes are for, for the enemies, for people who are trying to trip you up and don't want you, those who do not want your story to get out there. Um, how do you deal with that? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the question and also just for um, yeah, acknowledging me. I think as you posed or faced with each issue, you, you deal with it as the circumstances allow it. So let's start with initially, while I was at SAA, trying to talk to people who weren't even in my department. They didn't see it as serious, you know. So there's people that just don't see the impact that it could have on the company, on the country, and so yeah, so it's hard. So you find that you're almost bashing this wall and, and no one's listening. And actually in my book, I write there that um, to whistleblow, is, it's, it's, it's ironic that we say you whistleblow. And when you whistleblow, everyone looks, right? If you watch a referee 
on a, in a soccer match. Everyone, the spectators, together with the players, look. But if you're a true whistleblower, and Rosemary will identify with this, you blow that whistle, and it's like as if someone's strangling you. No sound is coming out because no one is listening and no one is hearing. And, and I write that because that's how I felt. I actually, I was ill. But here, I had illness just in my throat. And I realized it's because I am not yet able to tell my story, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so to go, carry on, we, how, how do you deal with it with, in the family situation? I have a big family of siblings. I had part of my family saying, resign, walk away. Don't get involved. Don't do anything, you know. And there were others that stood up and said, Mom, we know you. We know your principles. We know your values. Those were my daughters, my husband, and two of my um, sisters who, were, uh, who I was very close with. So they said, we'll be with you. We'll support you. I said, what about the loyal f lawyer's fees? I don't have much. They all said, we will get our savings and we'll find you the best lawyer. So... You know, um, not all of us will have that and not every family member will understand because they will prefer to disassociate themselves from that person and saying, oh, they're seeking attention. It's termed differently. Oh, they just want attention. But it's not that because when you're in that situation, all you want to do is you can see the bigger picture and you know the result and you're not looking at yourself. I, and I think Rosemary will identify, I didn't once look at my situation. I was looking at, this is wrong. This is seeking funding and paying someone so much money when there isn't even money in the company, when you can't even pay salaries, when you can't, and if we can't pay salaries, how do we fly? How We can't pay our bills. How do we get our passengers to where they're supposed to be? So you see, your thoughts are more outside yourself. But the people that want to judge you will think of you as, oh, she wants attention. Oh, it's about her. It's, you know, and it's never about you. Or I, I want to use the word never. It's seldom about you because I don't know enough stories yet to find out. Um, and then again, just to go back into the family situation, once you have your family support, I think that's what's important, even if it's one person. Because... I mean, I, if I can speak of my family, there's, there's two that didn't even acknowledge, you know what I'm saying? But I knew that they were grappling with the questions in their own mind and couldn't see it the way I saw it. But it's not for me to judge, and I didn't judge them, and neither did they judge me. There was just quiet and no support, but it was something I just accepted. So, And then you go into your friend space or your work colleague space. The friend space slowly disappeared because they, they didn't want, if your name is in the media, people don't want to be part of it because they don't understand how bad it is. Did you really commit a misconduct? And when you're in that field, the misconduct is always theft of money. It's, they don't see it as something else. And so you're already tainted before you had a voice to speak and support yourself. Uh, in the biggest fear with the media, the media's immediate reaction to me was defiant treasurer. So if you Google me, that's what's in the media. So if I apply for a job and some in HR will see that, defiant. So yes, it is a journey and I just feel we need to, again, re rely on that inner strength and the support of our family or friends that just can hold us up when we're in that space where all you want to do is curl up and die is just for them to hold you up, get through it, breathe. I'm, I'll use the word a lot, breathing, because that's what got me through. Breathing calms me, breathing sets my mind at ease, and breathing brings my focus back to the present. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, Rosemary, I don't know if you want to okay. make a comment. Sure. Um, it's not so, so familiar. And I, I actually mentioned to Catherine the other day, there's a woman at the Lockheed Commission going through the stuff right now, it sounds like. Or even, um, yeah, so there's this, and it is, it's interesting that there are some say that there's still seem to be so many women who have profile. Of course, there are many, many whistleblowers who don't have any kind of profile. But this whole thing, uh, what resonated to me, what was asked, Cynthia was saying, is that your, your motives get challenged before they actually look at what you are trying to say. Mm. So as soon as you are saying, so if something's wrong, they're saying, well, you know, are you having a bad day? Is it that, that, that time of the month? Are you getting a bit older? 
I mean, I was ultimately in, in, in court case with my boss, but I learned a grievance against him as an outlet for my emotions, um, which is a very, very strange thing. Mm. Um, and so constantly, uh, even, even recently, uh, when I was saying that, you know, criticizing something about um, something that the, the regulator is doing, I thought, well, why don't you just wait to, you know, move on? But in fact, it's causing people prejudice and hardship. Uh, particularly most vulnerable members of the community. It makes no difference in my life, but I'm saying that they're not doing their job properly. What, why, why, why tell me to move on and let it go? It's, it's actually fundamental to for who I am, but also what they should be doing as regulators and people who have given powers to protect your vulnerable members of the public. So it is infuriating. And I, I wonder how often it happens uh, Male whistleblowers. Does it happen as much? Have they asked if they have some personal problem they're trying to get over when they criticize somebody else? Uh, because if we just have to be speaking nice all the time. Um, but there was actually a very nice quote in uh, the Daily Maverick yesterday. Somebody called Charles Mackay said, He who is mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small as the work is that you have done, you've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cup from perjured lip. You've never turned the wrong to right. You've been a coward in the fight. Um, I, that was nice. Because the suggestion is if you make people cross, then you're just an ugly bitch. And uh, actually, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with doing the right thing. But that metaphor that you used, Rosemary, about blowing a whistle, or, or that Cynthia used about blowing a whistle, mm. but just feeling that there's no breath in you to be able to do it, it sounds like mm. an episode out of a bad dream, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and can you relate to that? Um, yeah, yes, well, I, I must say, when I was at the FSB, I did have a lot of secret support, particularly from the, young, uh, the junior people, uh, um, analysts and so on. And so I didn't feel uh, as alone as I might otherwise have done. Going into meetings with Exco, where they were all hounding me and so on, um, until towards the end, actually, one of one of the Exco uh, people was in the same position as me, the company secretary. As it happens, we were three lawyers, and the three of us were under attack. But at least... Um, you know, I wasn't entirely alone there, and of course I had a wonderful, uh, wonderful family, and um, Catherine, Catherine being one of them, a husband and daughter, and my brother and other sister as well. So I was very lucky, but there were times when I was scared, and it was I also just lost, I couldn't understand it. There I was tendering evidence, and, um, you know, I had a whole accumulation of evidence, and I said, put in details. Um, notices of non-compliance and grievance and so on, and I said, I hear, you know, I tended to provide the evidence. Uh, I found out later they actually did resolve to investigate my allegations against the dead CD, but then uh, they kept deferring it and deferring it and deferring it until my litigation was over and I, I lost um because they were pretending to investigate the cancellation. And they never investigated him, and he's still there, nearly 70 years old, making seven and a half million rand last year to be head of a regulator that is not doing its job. Very, very depressing. I mean, it's doing, there's some very good people there, but there's some very fundamental issues in relation to pension funds that are not being dealt with. Well, in fact, Rosemary, I had, you in, I had you in mind when I made that comment about the fact how often the law you know, becomes a sort of a blunt instrument. It actually leaves people often feeling disadvantaged because you went all the way to the Constitutional Court. And we often have the think that at long last, you've got the Concord, they will all see it. And then you were let down there too, in many respects. So I, I share that because part of this whole struggle is yes, we do need to have good legislation, good lawyers, good uh, inner precedents, excellent media, but at the end of the day, nobody's going to fight your battle for you. It's up to you, and it's up to you finding your own sort of, as it were, inner strength. Any other thoughts and, and comments that people want to make before we wrap up? Mike Moriarty, I see your hand waving there. Yeah, thanks very much. And um, sorry I'm only chipping in at the end here. Um, you know, I, I, I really do... Um, want to um, 
just to give the you know, appreciation for the work that is done by people like Cynthia and Rosemary um, and so many others, of course. Um, they've obviously had to go through a very, very hard path. I presume one of those hard paths is that I think that um, people who want to fight off whistleblowers do various things, and we've heard the kind of uh, hardships and threats and um, you know the, 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 the strategies that they've had to endure. But I, I think there are two things. One is that there seems to obviously be a high-stakes poker game that gets played by people who uh, want to defend their positions against the um, whistleblowers by using exactly. expensive ways. You, you've heard to that, John. Mm, and I yeah. don't know if there's um, uh, nowadays an easier route to get um, free or uh, cheap access to legal services so that whistleblowers can defend themselves. Um, and uh, whether or not Cynthia and Rosemary are able to say, look, here is the uh, little pathway that if you're going to be a whistleblower, these are the safe things for you to do. Mm. And these are the things that um, you know would, would end up giving you the armor uh, against the kind of bully tactics um, that are played by the people who uh, obviously want to fight off the whistleblowers. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Um, it, it is one of the challenges, and that's why very few people can afford it. And when they do, the lawyers um, that they have uh, taken to support them, the, the other party enlists the likes of your Weber Wenzel, CDH, um, you know, worksmen's, so the big guys that come and they just bully you. So out of it, yes, um, we've looked at, um, and most of the whistleblowers I've spoken to, there is the, the legal aid adverts, and they only take certain cases, and they don't have the capacity. Especially if it's a client like a SAA, they're not going to try and tackle a client like SAA. Uh, then there has been, I spent the better part of last year speaking to various, I went to CDH, I went to Weber Wenzel, I asked them, are they willing to have a section just to support whistleblowers pro bono? They don't do that. Um, Weber Wenzel does have a pro bono department. And in fact, most of them, but they only take on certain cases. So, um, and it's very rare that they're going to take that whistleblower through the labor, CCMA, or any of that route. For me, as whistleblowers shouldn't even touch that route. They should go straight, Protected Disclosures Act, and nail it at the top there. But it's not being done in that light. So part of what we want to achieve out of Citizens of Conscience is create, and it may be a separate entity because I don't think, um, to create a fund. Uh, at the moment, I'm just doing the research, so I haven't got it ready yet, is how can we have a fund and a platform for whistleblowers to come to? And this, the, the Netherlands have, uh, uh, they call it Hays for Klokkenleden in, in Dutch, which it means home for whistleblowers. And they're looking at the holistic picture of the whistleblower. So you can come there if you just need trauma counseling. You can come there if you need financial help. You can come there if you need um, the legal assistance. But in the Netherlands, it is 100% funded by government. Would we get that here? I don't know. And that I said, I'll do the research and I'll look at alternatives and then enlist a couple of people and see how we take it forward. My, the, the rough idea at the moment and the most pressing need is the financial side, is if we can raise, um, create a whistleblowing fund and get corporates who then say that I am a CEO and I give my pledge of integrity with the business leadership um, SA, but they do nothing. They're not putting their money where their mouth is. I would like them to put money in there, in that whistleblowing fund. So if every CEO of every single organization, be it corporate, um, private and public, put money into that. And then obviously we need to build rules around how do you um, disperse the funding, what's the criteria, etc. So that whistleblowers know they can have funds for a very good lawyer. We can enlist a good lawyer who's determined to win that case and not give up halfway. The second part is that each of us have debt to pay. We have homes, we have cars, we have um, smaller debts, insurance, we have to pay for food, lights and water, etc. It's then finding a mechanism, how do we ensure that they don't have this additional burden of where am I going to get my next cent from. 
And then looking at um, the funding side of the mental, taking care of the mental and physical health, I haven't yet, it's, it's written down, but I haven't yet tackled the issue, is speaking to companies like Discovery and Benita, all those medical aid companies, and saying, use your CSI now for whistleblowers, please. Mm -hmm. Because they won't have the funds anymore for medical aid, and we're all going to need it. How do we get there? So, um, so I'm still doing the research, but I love what you said, and yes, that is the path we want to, to go with. Um, the the Lawyer firms I spoke to last year definitely didn't want to go that route. They said we also need to make money. And so maybe we need to just find a way of working around that, that they, if they don't have a pro bono, are they willing to work with us at a reduced fee and they will get paid? Well, thank you. I think that we must wrap things up because people need to leave. Um, just by way of, uh, for folk who are still here and just for those of you who are going to be watching this in the recorded session, um, this really was a follow-on to the previous episode, which was with Mandy Weiner and a number of others having a conversation about creating a culture of whistleblowers in South Africa, a culture that supports whistleblowing, <laughs> and it's about the legislative process, etc., etc., and, and what can be done. One reflection I want to leave you with, for those of you who are watching this, just because I haven't yet got an answer to it fully, but... In order to build a culture of whistleblowing means we've got to dismantle a toxic culture of corruption. I mean, that's really the overriding issue here. Um, what will it take for civil society as a whole to basically dismantle the culture of corruption? To basically turn the to toxic into the tonic. I just love that sort of contrast. The toxic, what is it that's wrong with it? It means helping people who are, as it were, participants in that culture, who are vested in it, to recognize it's not in their interest, ultimately, to perpetuate it. And that particularly that power over strategies don't work. All they do is actually cause resentment, resistance, enmity, animosity, conflict and violence eventually. And that's really my insight from my social work colleague Brené Brown where she says power over no longer works. How do we change that story? How do we change that shared story? And I just love the way Cynthia has put it. It's about owning your own story. Going all the way down through that deep dark night of the soul if you want to call it however you wish to phrase it so that you can own your own story Chris when you know your center of gravity well you're not going to be that easily sucked into somebody else's orbit mm. you're not going to be jerked around you're going to have your own path it's about education it's about but it is about what faith means it's about fellowship it's about support and all the rest so I want to both leave that with a question what can we do to dismantle the culture of corruption and replace it with a culture of freedom so that it supports whistleblowers. Cynthia, thank you. Thank you for having One me. One last yes. takeaway for me. Uh, we talked about order, disorder, reorder. And I was brought up as well as a Catholic praying the rosary. Mm -hmm. But I haven't prayed the rosary for decades. <laughs> <laughs> You're punning there. <laughs> Thank you.